Great. Well, thank you and welcome uh, both here at the Forum uh, in Davos at the World Economic Forum to this important session, Financial Inclusion Addressing the Largest Gaps. Welcome to, to our audience online across the world. This is obviously a really vital global issue. Um, there's obviously a tremendous amount going on in the world right now and it's toweringly important as the geopolitical situation and the energy and food price shocks are. It's important we keep an eye on some of the other currents changing the world uh, and changing people's lives. I'm the economics editor of the BBC uh, in London, uh, one of the world's fintech hubs, uh, but my roots are in West Bengal and India and I kind of go back every two years and it's almost like a, a kind of slow motion slideshow <laughs> and you see the changes in uh, my cousin's lives, um, uh, the emancipating, emancipating power of technology to change people's lives. Uh, and whether it's the subsistence farmers who only a few decades ago had no access even to the basic democratic information about what the market traded prices for their goods were um, and get ripped off and impoverished by um, semi-evil uh, middlemen um, uh, who now have that market pricing power, or whether it's the female entrepreneurs lacking the capital, the ability to borrow the microloans <coughs> pioneered next door from West Bengal in Bangladesh by uh, Professor Yunus. Um, through forums such as, uh, as these, innovations have refracted back not just uh, from the Western capital system to uh, developing countries, but from developing countries back into the West in, um, in, in, in less uh, in impoverished areas, frankly, of countries like my own. They're using some of these techniques pioneered in the developing world. So amazing. This, these are the sorts of forums where those ideas get transferred, and hopefully that's what we can do uh, today. Uh, many issues. The lessons of the pandemic, when you open up the financial system to so many hundreds of millions of more people. What happens now? Global interest rates are rising to some of these loans. What happens when incomes are so squeezed between rising energy and food? Is there a smarter suite of products that can help act as some sort of bridge uh, in terms of this cost of living crisis for these types of, uh, uh, of customers? And where does this all go in the future in a world of central bank digital money where transactions can be traced to the person, time and geolocation? Uh, you can, if you're down uh, the line uh, watching this, you can go to slido.com and type in finclusion, F inclusion, uh, into the uh, hashtag and you'll be able to ask some questions that we can pick up and put to this great panel. Uh, and the panel I will introduce in a moment. It's an esteemed panel, but as esteemed as it is, we have a greater honour, as you can see in the form of Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, the United Nations Secretary General Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development, who wants to help set up this really important session. So, Your Majesty, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for this uh, very good introduction. Um, I love the way you actually said uh, it's a slow motion slideshow, and uh, because it is true, you see, if you're there, you don't really realize, but you know, so much has changed. And we have come together at a very defining moment. Um, as we emerge from this global pandemic that has kept us apart for two years, I'm very happy I just arrived to be here back again. We are seeing that it has also spawned really an unprecedented number of digital connections. When COVID-19 hit, governments rushed to provide financial relief to citizens, often through digital channels. At the same time, social distancing forced people to find alternatives to cash and face-to-face -face shopping. Mobile money usage skyrocketed. In Latin America alone, 50 million adults began using digital merchant payments. The latest data will arrive this summer in June when the new global FinDEX is released. But we already know that while over 1.2 billion adults have gained access to financial services in the last decade. And we are expecting that to grow by many millions more. <coughs> now, if we have learned one thing about financial inclusion, it is that better access, new users, and higher transaction numbers is simply not enough. Over the last year, I have advocated for enhancing the resilience of underserved groups in the face of economic shocks, so they are better able to seize economic opportunities. MSMEs have been hard hit by COVID-19, especially informal ones and those owned by women. For these enterprises, going from pen to and paper to digital is one of the keys to financial recovery and resilience. At the G20 Leader Summit in Rome last year, I urged governments to accelerate digital solutions for SMEs 
around the world. Going it digital can open new markets and have businesses more efficient. A digital ecosystem can help small businesses better manage their inventory, marketing, payments, credits and sales. It can also help MSMEs gain access to financial services. For example, their data footprint can be used by financial institutions to provide financing more quickly and at better rates. Another very important issue is, once the population is financially included, does it really lead to better financial lives? Are they financially healthy? Good financial health means being more resilient to financial setbacks and better equipped to seize opportunities. A financially healthy population can recover faster on their own and relieve pressure on government safety nets. This is a responsibility that concerns us all. Financial health should be a common goal of governments, regulators, the private sector, the financial sector and NGOs. For financial service providers in the room, you will likely discover that investing in your customers' financial health will mean they can pay their loans on time, purchase other products and services, and cost less to serve. There is a very strong case on financially healthy customers. Having better information and insights on customers can also help you design products that influence financial behaviors for the better. Saving products that nudge people to achieve their goals are a very good example. Now, as we continue to close the financial in inclusion gap, I encourage you all to apply a financial health <coughs> perspective to all your efforts. This will enable us to achieve the purpose of financial inclusion and create more resilient economies and probably more stable ones. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have a very fruitful discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Your Majesty. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. I know. I know you have to. Uh, we'll you have to, to go on. But, but, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to miss you. Not at all. Thanks again for coming. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now, okay, we're going to. We're very efficient with our. We're just going to. Great. Oh, no. Excellent. Right, so we uh, are now going to complete the panel up here. People have been queuing to be on this panel. So <laughs> let me quickly introduce uh, uh, in order here. Of course, we have the governor of uh, the Banque de France, uh, Central Bank of France, uh, Francois Villeroy de Gaillard. Um, and then I'll just, uh, we're w in a mo uh, and then uh, uh, we will have in a second uh, Gelsomina <laughs> Viliotti, who is just going to replace Hishis. Oh, she's, Thank she's you, Gelsomina. Yeah. Thank you very much. Who is from the European Investment Bank and a former senior official in the Italian Treasury. Um, then uh, we have uh, Andre Solistio, the chief executive <laughs> officer of the GoTo Group in Indonesia. Uh, we have Adim Ahmed of the Lulu Financial Group in the UAE. Uh, and then we have uh, Karabo Morule of Capital Art, who is a, uh, an act who was an actuary, or still is an actuary. I don't think you ever lose being an actuary. You don't. Who, uh, <laughs> but now runs um, a very interesting, uh, the, the Capital Art project, which is trying to refashion how people treat African art. So again, keep those questions coming on Slido. Let's, um, uh, let's begin with you, Karabo, about the... Because uh, we've got perspectives from every continent here, and it's really important. Different savings cultures, different borrowing cultures, so there isn't a one-size-fits-all. Um, tell us about your experience of financial inclusion and spreading it as far as possible and where it's going. Mm. So for about 10 years, I actually worked at All Mutual, which is a large financial services conglomerate in South Africa, focusing on middle-income customers. And you start to realize that even when we think, yes, people who are in the middle income know everything about finance, finances, you start to realize that actually they don't necessarily do so. 
And financial education plays a really big role in that particular market to help them think about financial inclusion, in particular exposure to insurance products. Um, and I know we often talk about financial inclusion in relation to banking, yes. but actually insurance products are there to kind of really make sure that you're um, reducing the opportunity for a large financial outcome to ruin you financially um, by making small contributions over time and passing on that risk to somebody else. So that's something which I think a lot of people miss. Yeah. Um, but it's been incredible to see. And um, now I also sit as a non-executive director of Time Bank. That's the first bank um, <coughs> in South Africa to have their bank core banking platform in the cloud. And they've been doing some phenomenal work in the area of financial inclusion and actually won two awards with a focus on uh, women specifically. And um, they've been doing a great uh, amount of work to focus on <coughs> people who are in low income, uh, making sure that you know their bank account doesn't um, ha attract bank fees. So you can deposit an amount kind of two years ago, which is like I did, because obviously I sit on the social ethics committee. I wanted to make sure I experience the services of the bank. And um, the same amount is still there, even though I have not touched that amount. And that really plays a big role, especially for people who are financially vulnerable, around how they use that account for savings, which a lot of people then aren't normally um, able to, um, you know, for example, access things like money market funds, where the amount that you need to invest on a monthly basis is around 500 Rand. Um, all these people are kind of earning less than five and a half dollars a day. And that's why these types of products are really important. Well, you immediately corrected me because I totally forgot about insurance. And of course, insurance is like the most fundamental uh, uh, protective uh, barrier for people against calamity. And there's plenty of calamity around at the moment. Uh, encourage all of you, uh, you'll, you know your territories and your markets. Give us an insight into the data, you know, how much it's spreading, how it's changing savings culture or borrowing culture. Um, let's go on to Mr. Ahmed's perspective from the, uh, the UAE. Sure. Um, so we are a UAE-based entity, but uh, we spread across 10 odd countries, you know, so GCC, Indian subcontinent, and uh, Asia Pacific, you know. Um, I'll take the example of two countries, one is UAE and one is India, of course, where we have a uh, large presence out, you know. Uh, so the major question for us is to get the unbanked, and we are much into the cross-border space where uh, uh, we have migrant populations. Looking at the, the, the whole demographic of the GCC countries, you will find that, you know, around 80% uh, of the population uh, is an expatriate population and they work there to send their money back home, you know. So how do we get uh, this money back into the accounts of people are out in the most effective manner, the shortest period of time, and the most cost-efficient uh, manner out, you know. That becomes the first chain, you know. And the second chain about for where we try to identify is to create uh, a customer experience journey out, you know, uh, where we kind of understand where this money is used so that on the other end of the, of the customer journey, we try to give them uh, micro loans and financing and so and so forth, you know. Uh, the biggest challenge that we have faced on this side is, is one, is to find, um, identify data of the end consumer use, uh, mapping of the financial journey of each of the consumers. Uh, we were not able to find out how to collect the last mile uh, availability in each of the countries because of the rural accessibility is becoming a bit more harder. Um, and the positive side is that India has taken a, a, a giant leap on this aspect, you know, with, with coming out of Aadhaar, uh, which is uh, an identity proof today covers around 90% of the, the population in India, has really helped us to really fast track that journey out, you know. And also with the uh, unified payment network that has now come to play in India, which has really, really helped in terms of making sure that, you know, we can get the money out into the consumers in the shortest and the most cost-effective manner. Similarly, if you look at UAE, in 2009-10, they came out with a wage protection system, which is a, a, a unified platform, platform that has been done by the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Labor, where it enforces that every um, employee needs to be paid through a bank or a plastic thus uh, ensuring that they get paid every month and there is a traceability on this uh, uh, usage of, of funds, you know. So this, all these, these very effective methodologies has really increased uh, the inclusiveness in, in this vast two countries. Uh, if you really look at it, India receives around 87 billion every year into inward uh, remittance flow. Wow. And a large amount of that money comes out of the GCC uh, countries, you know. And to effectively manage the use of this fund in the closest possible time, the use of technology has really helped us. And I think so the last three uh, years have really fast-tracked the use of this uh, uh, digital transformation. Uh, and today, the use of Internet of Data 
has also further helped in in making sure that you know the customers of both the sites are are well uh, um, taken care of. And just really quickly, in India, yes. I just have no concept. Yes. I have a concept that in the UK and the US we borrow. And in Korea, they save, right? Yes. In India, I, I just can't really quite... You know, are, 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 your, are your new customers, your newly included customers, are they savers or are they borrowers? Are they both? You know, what, what... It depends on which generation they are from. Okay, so, so it's a generation. <laughs> it's the same model, the same it's life cycle model. model. model okay. you know, so uh, the younger generation are, yes, uh, they're more onto the spending side of things. The earlier generations uh, are, are things. But, you know, a very interesting aspect that we've recently found out is... is how the migration pattern has yes. changed, you know. Um, a generation before, the migrants who were living in UAE as such used to save money, send it to the subcontinent. Yeah. They used to buy real estate down there. Uh, the younger generation today takes a flight, goes back to the, the subcontinent, sells everything that their parents have made and bought the money outside the country. So there is also a reverse flow of, of uh, funds that are wow. happening at this point of time. Because of larger level of globalization that is happening and, you know, people uh, moving out of the country as well, you know. So that's a very interesting uh, stimulus that we have seen in the last couple of years. Could be a trigger of the COVID where people have found out other countries to be much more uh, adaptable in terms of quality of living and so and so forth. Or the, the ability for you to work from anywhere in the world, you know. Uh, and, and need you, not to be in, in one, one particular junction. And, and you two have already proven to me that, yes. you know, it, when you have the numbers, the data, the actuarial data or the lending data, you know how society is changing more, Absolutely. way before any politicians <laughs> or journalists, frankly. <laughs> um, but um, I'm reminded by of remittances, obviously, sure. bigger than aid flows. Yeah. I'm not quite sure by how much, but somebody will have the figure. Um, let's go on to your experience in Indonesia, fascinating technological developments that you've pioneered. Why don't you tell the, the audience about them and tell us about the, the marketplace. Yeah, sure. Um, so we're, uh, we, we're uh, I'm from GoTo, um, so we have a, a few products. Uh, one is uh, Gojek, Tokopedia, e-commerce, and also on-demand services. One of the interesting things that we've uh, actually experienced is that um, to be able to address the gaps for financial inclusion, first, we have to bring society into digital inclusion first. And that's actually something that we experience with the rate of development of our government on infrastructure such as accessibility and connectivity. It gave birth to companies like us in being able to actually use digital means to connect a lot of the underserved into the uh, formal economy. And that happened with Gojek and Tokopedia as well. Seven years ago, uh, in Gojek cases, we actually serve what we call the Ojek community, which is an informal motorcycle drivers who are underserved, not part of formal, formal economy. We empower them to be the last mile logistics for people to go somewhere, to uh, deliver food, deliver items and whatnot. And suddenly, what started as tens of thousands community now became like three or four million uh, of you know, this populations that is served using technology uh, and being able to be part of the for formal economy because of technology. Similarly in Tokopedia, a lot of uh, uh, merchants, before if you wanted to sell in Indonesia, you have to be in shopping malls. Big city, Jakarta, Surabaya, and you have to be in sh shopping mall to be able to market your product. With Tokopedia, with, the, with our marketplace concept where we connect users with lots of small micro-entrepreneurs or mom and pop shops, that allows uh, transaction to be happen uh, borderless and wherever you are you can be in a small city in Indonesia you can sell to customers in Jakarta and then that, that that connection is important now it's important to start there because our experience is that if we don't help to actually get them to generate more income first it's hard to sustain financial inclusion because uh, it comes after so what what our experience is that once we see the small merchants uh, small driver partners that doesn't have any track record before. And because we are a platform that connects their digital transaction, suddenly it becomes a track record that wasn't uh, there before. If, if they go to a bank, they will be rejected because yeah. you, know, you don't have a track record. Uh, we do. And, and therefore, uh, a lot of the development is actually to help them to, you know, for us to use those data to then uh, provide them with financial products. Uh, it could be savings, it could be working capital, um, it could be uh, lending, insurance, we talk about insurance and stuff. And that is actually a, a motion that actually will be sustainable because you introduce them to more income and then we help to 
manage their op operations or their life better with financial product, and therefore the financial well-being will be sustained. But but that's just a one-story part of it. Um, there's there's plenty of more uh, development that needs to be done. I think. Um, uh, there's a special mention about things like real-time payments, uh, UPI, ADAR, infrastructure, pu uh, private, and uh, private and public needs to work together to ensure the infrastructure for financial inclusion can be cheaper. But things like real-time payment is such a valuable uh, mm -hmm. infrastructure. If cost of moving money is not close to zero and seamless, it's really hard to actually build sustainability. And I think the great thing is Indonesia government is realizing that and there's a lot of development on that. So we're looking forward for that uh, next evolution and stage. So what I take from you is amazing innovation uh, and creativity in, in, in targeting an, a financially excluded group that is critical to the way that the economy works and expanding from there. Um, and, but then also critically using your information and data to be able to develop financial products. So in the same way a credit rating agency might do it, you have a different source of data. How Very, very interesting. Um, uh, so moving on um, to um, Gelsamina, um, you know, from a U European perspective, um, it's obviously different. The market's more developed, but you, you help fund some of, you help fund, you know, those people who are continue to be excluded in the UK, in the EU, um, and some development projects outside as well? Yes, no, definitely. Uh, first of all, thank you for um, having invited me to, to this panel for two reasons. You mentioned at the very beginning that I come from the Italian Treasury. Actually, I joined the European Investment Bank uh, last year. After that, uh, you know, I run the, the finance track of the G20. And actually, you know, um, within the Italian presidency, but also on, uh, under the Indonesian presidency and also in, under previous uh, presidencies of the G20, the financial inclusion is one of the most relevant topic because, you know, you know, this uh, widespread recognition that, uh, you know, providing access to finance is an opportunity to grow, to, to be inclusive. Uh, and uh, so in this regard, it's uh, something which is very relevant to, to my career and also to the AIB. At the AIB, uh, the European Investment Bank, uh, we are a large uh, financier. As you rightly said, uh, we mainly invest uh, within the European Union, but we have also a large portfolio outside of the European Union. Actually, annually, we invest uh, between 8 and 10 billion outside of the European Union. And where we invest, you know, I would say that we go from uh, large infrastructure, which are important, you know, for the, for the economies, uh, and also to the financing of uh, SMEs. Actually, SMEs, it's uh, financing SMEs is uh, at the very center of the activity of the European Investment Bank, both uh, uh, inside the, the Union and outside of the European Union. And I can give you some example of what we do also within the European Union to include person. Let me start from the outside of the European Union. Actually, you know, so to start a, a business, uh, uh, you know, in a difficult environment, in fragile economies, uh, you need, you know, I mean, we have to rely on uh, financial intermediaries. So our first uh, task is to find what are the right financial intermediary which can uh, go along with our objective, can, that can ensure that we can achieve the, uh, the objective that we want to achieve. Uh, that is to, to create a business case. You know, actually, you know, what is not, it's only important to have access to finance, but also to have, a, you know, it's a, it's a business case to be financed. And actually, I think that what is most important is the access to finance, but at the same time, also providing the, the skills and the ability to create a business case. Because, you know, very often, you know, when uh, you have a business case, it's, uh, it's much easier to, to get uh, finance for a sustainable investment. Because in the end, you know, once that you start an activity, you, you need also to, to run it and to, to get it sustainable. So outside the union, we have several examples. And I like to pick one of the examples uh, uh, which uh, bring in the insurance case. Actually, we invested in a fund. As I said, you know, we go through financial intermediaries to, uh, through funds. And actually, we invested in a, funds, in a fund. And this fund is uh, uh, operational in 10 countries. 
and they offer uh, finance to micro and small and medium enterprises but at the same time also an insurance against the climate adverse effect because you know especially within the agriculture sector we know how relevant is that you know it's a farmer can be safeguarded with respect to the impact of uh, extreme climate um, in Jordan we we finance access of women to, to, to finance, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fund which is uh, completely dedicated only on, uh, on women. And uh, we have a very interesting case also within the European Union with the, the Roma communities in Bulgaria and Romania. Actually, this is a very underserved segment of the society. And through the European Investment Fund, which is a subsidiary of the European Investment Bank, which actually uh, it's, a, it's an instrument uh, whose motto is uh, we believe in small, oh. and uh, which is dedicated, you know, to to the small and medium enterprises. And through this uh, instrument, we uh, provided guarantee for Roma um, communities, for entrepreneurs within the Roma communities, so that they could start their their business. So there are many uh, underserved group within also within the European Union, you know, and we have to look also at the way in which we can provide the social impact and. Uh, you know, finance can also uh, provide, uh, you know, the opportunity to, um, to create a social impact. And especially if uh, you, um, you provide uh, the people the right instruments and uh, the right skill to prepare their case and to access finance. And in this regard, for instance, we also provided the online course on, uh, on financial inclusion so that, you know, through a direct access to the to the, our website, there could be the opportunity to to have um, you know information and to have a basic 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 skill. Great. Well, so we continue the telling the tale of how important uh, this agenda is, and also how it's applying itself across different continents. Uh, I'll continue with one more easy question for the governor uh, in terms of how it applies in a developed country um, such as such as your own in France. Before we get a, a bit tougher, but go. On. Uh, I will try to be tough already. <laughs> and saying that financial inclusion has probably two parts. Uh, the first one is universal access to financial services. I will say some words about that. But the second part or the second pillar is the right use of these financial services. And this second challenge, we have it in common between emerging and advanced economies. Let me say one quick word about the first part, universal access. Here, obviously, in emerging and developing economies, digitalization is of the essence. It's a very powerful accelerator. As Her Majesty said, we will see what the next global FINDEX figures are. But to give you very impressive figures for Africa under your control, 10 years ago, in 2011, less than a quarter of African people had access to financial services. We hope that by the next FINDEX, more than half will have access in 10 years, thanks to digitization. In France, the same figure is more than 95%. So we don't have a real problem of access. We have, by the way, a right in the law to banking account, and the central bank is responsible for this procedure. And we could even say that digitalization could raise some questions. It's a very powerful accelerator. I was impressed by what you said in most economies. In our case, we need, we need less this accelerator. It could create problems for older people. It's the only caveat I, I would say. Yeah. I come. I don't know if there are some in the room. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> OK, no, I, I come, if you allow me, to the very important second pillar right use of financial services. And this is what we call probably financial education or financial literacy. This is an international challenge for all of us on this stage, for all countries. It's an OECD priority. We, and let me tell you a small story which might be of interest. We in the central banks were attributed this mission not very late ago, it was 2016, so six years ago. It was a very significant change, and frankly, at the start, there was an internal discussion. Is it a core mission for us? Is it as serious than, say, monetary policy or banking supervision? 
very core missions with figures uh, where much technicality, where central bankers are usually expected. Yes, it is core mission. Uh, and let me say some words about that. It is core mission, first, due to its objectives. Prevention, for example, is very important. We are in charge of over indebtedness. If we help uh, some poor families to manage better their budget, we will have less over indebtedness. We talked earlier about cryptos and young people. If we help young investors, quote unquote, uh, to be careful about cryptos, to say the least, and to know that there is no sure bet and that it can be an illusion, as we saw in recent months, it's part of our business. But let me give you still two objectives which are still more <coughs> ambitious. On monetary policy, we could think that there is no relation. There is. Because we must learn how to speak not only with market specialists, ECB watchers in our case, or excellent journalists, but also with the broad public. Think of inflation expectations. Think of the inflation worries today, topic number one in most of our countries. We must speak to the broad public and expect how monetary policy will re-anchor inflation expectations. Think of a very simplistic question. Did you try to explain to your family? I tried. My children are educated, but they are not economists. Can you explain me, Dad, why when you raise interest rates, you decrease inflation? It's not that obvious. Think about it. This belongs to financial education <laughs> and the efficiency of monetary policy. And the last objective is about democratic debate. I strongly believe on that. There are many economic issues which are more and more complex about distribution, growth, etc. And the economic consequences of geopolitical shocks. If we give our fellow citizens some tools to understand, it's probably the nicest mission we, we can have. And let me add, if I still have 30 seconds, Faisal, uh, another point why it's a core mission, but an, a very innovative one. It's due to its objective. It's also due to its ways and means. We cannot do it alone. Monetary policy, we are in charge. Bank supervision, we are in charge. But for financial education, we are more or less a conductor of an orchestra, including NGOs, including, yes, media. And to give you uh, two very quick examples, First, education, teachers, and now we work with the teachers and for young people who are about 13 or 14 years old, we have introduced a financial pass, so to say, uh, which will become systematic. It's a huge uh, change. And second, gamification. Do you expect monetary policy staff to be very technical guys, experts, to present figures, slides, curves, etc. But the most efficient way is escape games. And now we come with our escape games and we try to increase financial literacy with that. Frankly, I didn't expect it. I'm not a specialist in escape game, but it's for me a story of humility and hope. Good. Okay, well, let's, we've, got, well, we've given you a broad vista now. Let's just. What I'm fascinated by, and I want the whole panel to respond to this, um, is we've had this financial shock that's hit the whole world, the pandemic, and there's another shock now in terms of prices. Uh, we can all be very happy and smiley about how the great opportunities of, of, of this agenda. But let's be clear, the COVID pandemic, I don't know about your countries, but in the UK saw a massive exponential leap in the fraud and scams on the most vulnerable, vulnerable people. And, I, and there's a flip side to including pe people, which is some of, some of the dangers. I just, I just wondered, what has been the record of the newly included during these extremely difficult financial times, the stress test, if you like, to what you're trying to do? And, um, uh, uh, and what lessons do you draw from the data about the financial behaviour of, uh, of some of the newly included? Uh, who wants to go first? Uh, maybe Andre. Um, yeah, so so just just sharing some experience. I think during the pandemic, um, 
one of the uh, positive thing, and, and again, a lot of the perspective from our side comes first from the uh, MSMEs, uh, and then let's talk about the consumers. Um, be, because of the uh, pandemic, there's a rush on uh, a lot of these uh, micro entrepreneurs and businesses to go digital, and, and therefore a lot of what we innovate uh, either through our you know e-commerce or food delivery um, for food merchants and stuff is to be able to help them to onboard very quickly, so easily, so that anyone can actually start, right? And that's that's the case. And we saw, um, you know, a couple of millions of new additions wow. into the system. So the market opportunity there yes. was the main factor. Exactly. And, okay. And that and that actually was a saving grace, if you may. Yeah. Where where a lot of the income that was lost now uh, gotten back because of that opportunity. And we also see a lot of um, um, people, folks, who actually lost their job started becoming an entrepreneur because of how this these platforms makes it very easy for anyone to start a business. And that's actually a there's a lot of positivity okay. into it. That might not No 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 no, no. So I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be a journalist <laughs> trying to create controversy but, but you know let me give you an anecdote. I mean I I um, and we'll, we'll spread this out. You know I remember when mobile phones, the story I told you about West Bengal, you know, mobile phones came in, the farmers were excited about having the prices text message to them, but they were also being texted by a reputable mobile phone company, you know, click this Bollywood person if you like them, and guess what, they were charged 10 rupees, you know, that sort of stuff happens too, and, mm -hmm. I, and I, 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 in barely literate, or, you know, or newly literate populations and newly financially included populations, um, it, are the newly financially included resilient, financially resilient, uh, uh, Mr. Ahmed? Are you finding? Well, I would put it on a different way, you know. So uh, these are guys who were fastly onboarded into a technology or a, into a platform in which education was not given just enough. Yeah. Uh, hence, they are more vulnerable to a large-scale fraudulent activities. You know, uh, every con uh, company in the last three years or two years who has been um, in this field. Uh, wanted to do a large-scale onboarding of, of consumers into yeah. their platform. We're talking like uh, tens of millions, hundreds tens of, of millions. millions yeah, yeah, hundreds yeah. of millions, you yeah. know. I mean, um, if you look at India also, you know, you see uh, different consumer base being increased. A uh, lot more digital platforms have, have come inside, you know. And everybody addressing uh, different problems, you know. Uh, but at the same point of time, they were not given enough time to have their platform set uh, enough time to give out that education to the consumers to use and so on and so forth, which put up a large scale opening of, of consumer frauds that you rightly set up, you know. Yeah. Uh, but what's the, the good thing out, you know? The good thing is uh, the factor that since they were onboarded, uh, now it's a good time for them to be given that kind of uh, okay. um, financial literacy and at the same point of time, handhold them to really start using the platform which could benefit them. Now, being on the platform and being on, on things. So if you look at the uh, MSME sector as such, or the uh, uh, sector, today we have a data of a consumer who was never there on the banking network, you know. Okay. Uh, thus, giving a journey to this, this particular consumer who can then be taken inside. Okay. So there's always been a talk about public-private partnerships and so on and so forth. I strongly feel that the, 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 the regulators have done a lot in the last decade, you know. Okay. So what we require now is to have private-private partnerships, you know. Everybody is now becoming more nationalistic, where in the same way, you know, banks are becoming more uh, reserved and they are saying that we would like to control the entire space of, of, of uh, uh, the consumer journey. We need more partnerships. We need them to partner with new fintechs. We need to give them an open. New banking has been there. Uh, this is a conversation that we've been having. But in, in certain economies, the banks are still very closed. Okay. They don't want to open up information to uh, so for your perspective, the opportunity is so large that it, the, the, always a dark side to everything. But we're still way, we're well up. Yes. Um, so well, can I, yeah, of course. Yeah. Can, can I play down this idea of a trade-off between digitalization and safety? Mm -hmm. okay. I yes. don't believe in this mm. trade-off, or mm. at least we have many ways to escape it. We should make progress in universal access. We should also make progress in regulation, prevention, yes. and education. In our case, we increase the digitalization of payments, obviously, but we also increase the safety. And uh, it, it, it's the, the, the most efficient way to, to increase access. Uh, because this idea of a trade-off can be very toxic, because you could say, I would slow down digitalization, or I would be uh, ready to pay for frauds. No, there is no necessity for that. Another issue I only mention is the increased risk of cyber attacks.
Okay. This one is more serious. Yeah. We should be very vigilant. And if the financial system is more digital, it could be more vulnerable. But if I may say it, so far, so good. If the three months, we are today exactly three months after the invasion of Ukraine, and we didn't see increase of cyber attacks. I touched the wood everywhere, and we are very vigilant. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, here, here, let me put it another way, okay? Mm -hmm. um, uh, financial services companies, the data, again, we'll come back to the data. You know so much about your customers. The actuaries know, know so much, the people lending their money. You know more than they may even know about themselves, right? Now, that's something that works with some of the most wealthy people in the world. When you combine that with just newly financially emancipated, some people who have, you know, numeracy levels and literacy levels might be, not be as high as we might think, that imbalance seems so huge. And, and some people's business models involve, to some degree, exploiting that. Or am I just a cynical journalist? No, no, no I think you're right that, um, you know, wherever there's an opportunity, people will try and take it on the negative side. Yeah. Um, but I think it's just been so wonderful to see the amount of interest in fintech on the African continent to try and address some of these challenges. Okay. Um, and also people being so innovative about the ways in which I think traditional banking system has excluded people yeah. and finding different ways of how to include people. And I think it is kind of that's where the future is. I think digital, the digital side enables people to also get a holistic view of, of um, how people are managing their finances. But I think also leveraging technology enables to you to get a, also a way, a way of thinking of it saying, to drive the correct behavior. So things like, for example, on middle income customers, you realize that actually a lot of people get disheartened with buying insurance because they feel like, you know, I got this advisor who sold me this product and I never saw them again. Mm. And obviously that's related to the incentives related to upfront commission. Mm. Um, what has been great to see is financial service, you know, econ ecosystems where they've been incentivizing the fact that the customer holds on to the product for longer and longer because then they get the real benefit of the product. And in particular insurance, this, you see this phenomenon. Um, but also the fact that, um, you know, in, in the uh, personal finance business that I was managing, what we started to do was also making sure that advisors got to see their customers once a year. And that's really important because you want to make sure that, yes, in the past year, if something has changed about this individual, you want to make sure that the plan that they have is still right for them. And I think what's great about this is that obviously, yes, you know, there's the incentive to focus on middle income simply because they've got more to spend on you and they, you can make more money from them if you're a financial institution. But actually, I think we should be leveraging data to try and make sure that we can actually give in more access to people in the lower income spaces to see that they're also doing the right thing. So a big challenge in South Africa, for example, is a lot of people taking um, funeral benefits when actually for middle income customers, they should be taking life insurance because actually the risk to them is much greater than just what a funeral benefit can provide. And you do see this problem where a lot of people are buying multiple funeral policies because they're sort of trying to access a greater <laughs> amount based on the fact that they want to you know, protect their livelihood in the incidence of their breadwinner passing away or something something happening to them and you realize there they really need that access point or, or the data that guides them to say okay I see you're buying a lot of um, funeral products which actually are really very high margin that's why everybody's piling in to, to get into that business you should actually be taking out a life insurance product that's actually much lower margin for the business but it's much better for the customer okay um, um, let's throw this forward well actually let's bring it up to date with the very current situation we're seeing pressure on incomes like never before Big, another big stress test. You know, in the pandemic, there was massive, massive support, which kind of helped things along. Now, just incomes falling. Um, I don't. Know, ha, uh, is this new financial uh, inclusion? Is it is it ready? Is it ready to? Is it stable enough to deal with a real shock to to, con to, to the incomes of, of the newly financially included? Yeah, so actually, um, after, um, you know, it's, um, at the end of last year, we, um, we ran a series of uh, surveys with banks in Africa and uh, in other regions of the world. And for instance, the, you know, the survey from, from Africa, which actually confirmed what was just said, uh, you, know, it, you know, actually the picture that came out of uh, the service that in the end, the banking system within the African um, continent, it, it uh, reacted well to the COVID uh, crisis, maybe because there was a good uh, capitalization 
uh, starting good capitalization and there there were also you know a lot of um, policy um, intervention also in other parts of the world also the EIB the European Investment Bank provided financial packages to support small and medium enterprises and to support uh, local business what happens now you know actually is that you know Everything was based on, uh, you know, on, uh, on the assumption that then with the recovery, you know, you could start a new uh, growth phase and that, you know, all of these uh, support could have been uh, reabsorbed and also that, you know, so the, the local business could have been flourished uh, again. Now the issue is that uh, what happens to this, uh, maybe to the new business which, uh, you know, was created, were created during the pandemic, so which managed to survive, you know, how they can uh, cope with that. What we see now also talking with, uh, you know, financial institution, local financial institutions, is that uh, what is more in needed now is uh, some sort of risk sharing uh, uh, mechanism, you know, some incentives that, uh, for instance, Will, will help to provide, continue to provide finance with a lower level of collateral, uh, with, uh, you know, new financial instruments. And uh, okay. in this regard, I think oh. that uh, there is a, an evolution that uh, we have to look at uh, since, you know, actually, you know, crisis after crisis, uh, it can uh, get serious consequences. Okay, I'm going to put a question immediately to the governor, but, you know, do, do come in with your questions. We've got five or six minutes. We've, we've slightly extended this. Um, we've got some good questions from the Slido too. New financial instruments, alarm bells maybe start to ring. Do they perhaps, you know, I did the journalism on the origins of the subprime crisis in the US. There were, there were some good intentions there and financially underprivileged people were ripped off and uh, it, was a, it was a bad uh, combination of financial innovation, big institutions, bad regulation and starting off with an attempt to spread finance uh, are there any you think the systemic benefit of just spreading the financial no, system no. is so stabilizing uh, that it counter counteracts any potential problems I, I think it's a very important question can i link it with the previous one oh, because yes. i think there is a very important <laughs> link uh, so about the effect of the ukrainian crisis uh, i would share what gelsomina said i'm vigilant but confident on financial institutions themselves they are solid and by the way the next increase in interest rates will help them, including the new digital banks, because they are very reliant on the value of their deposits and so the level of interest rates. Another question, which brings me to financial innovation, is the consequences for people themselves, for households and for the poorest one. Here we must say very clearly that finance and financial services cannot bring all the solutions that kind of finance cannot bring miracles. And here is a link with your last question. If you refer to the subprime, it was an illusion. And the illusion that everybody could have access to real estate, whatever his real income was. And it went to a catastrophe. You can imagine all the new financial instruments you want including on the saving side, be it pyramids, uh, be it cryptos, be it whatever you want. Finance will not create value and income for the people per se. And if there is a lack of income, if there is a lack of growth, it refers to fiscal policies, to structural policies, to the work and genius of individual companies. But the idea that financial inclusion, which is very welcome, could mean financial miracles in difficult times would be extremely dangerous. Now, we all agree about that in this room, but frankly, look at what happened with subprimes. You are right. It was a wrong and very dangerous promise. And I, I, uh, th there are many lessons to draw for, for, from yeah, the, yes. the subprimes. A different panel but panel. For, me, for me, the most interesting one is this kind of political support which was behind uh, the subprimes. Uh, so some politicians bought and sold this very dangerous financial yeah. illusion. Yeah. No, no, I, I was very affected by going into uh, a pasta in Baltimore and it had become so integrated that the bank was selling mortgages and the church was getting $100 
the mortgage, and they were channeling it. And so, so this is to me about trust and innovation. You know, and I, I don't want to be negative because I think there's amazing stories here. But I guess this is about the plumbing, isn't it? You guys are plumbers, and it's about connecting people, not creating miracles in terms of uh, life standards. And that, that's, but the, but there's enough plumbing to be done. You need uh, the sewers need to be created. Not maybe not the sewers. The uh, the, the fresh water uh, supply needs to be tapped into every corner of the world, and there's still lots of opportunity there. Um, uh, any question? Uh, anybody want to come in from here before I go to Slido? Um, okay. Um, right. Uh, one question here is: Credit reporting from anonymous acts as the backbone of credit. What do you see as gaps in credit reporting and what can tech do for access, particularly for migrants? Anyone want to pick that up? Yeah, I'll take it up. Um, um, so just to uh, take a step back and uh, say that, you know, see, uh, the digital inclusion is a great thing, you know, mm -hmm. but one should not forget that there is also a need of an emotional connect at the bottom level. Um, so understanding your consumers, you know, so because when you move away from not having physical touch points, uh, you don't get a very clear picture about what your end consumer actually does, you know. So that's you and the consumer? That's me. You and don't I, visit them? No. You've just got a set of metrics about them? Yeah, so every algorithm does not give you a clear picture of your customer, you know. So it doesn't yeah. give you what the customer actually wants, you know. It could, it could take you to a certain level. So being digital and moving away from the online, I mean, on the brick and mortar space, uh, most of the times has not helped us, you know. So there needs to be still... Uh, a need for a last mile connectivity uh, on the bottom level. You know? Okay, Physic that's physical. Physical, yes. Okay. Because yeah, no, the level. algorithms can only go so far. Yes. We haven't talked about the algorithms, have we? You know, so the algor I it, just wanted to put that inside. You know, so I mean, being digital is all great, uh, but one should not take that, that last mile connectivity of your uh, consumers because then you don't get a real picture of them. Then you cannot map their financial journey. Okay, so I just want someone to, and we've got one minute, and we walk around Davos and we see AI this and Web7 this and all that sort of stuff, and it creates a massive computing power to try and analyze humans, yeah. and some of these algorithms... You end up paying a lot of money to the cloud people. You right, know? well, they, 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 they seem to throw the... Yeah, yeah, they seem to have the cash here. But, uh, but, the, but, the, uh, but the algorithms, uh, do they m marry with financial inclusion? Or can they, in, within them, exclude? I think um, there's two sides to it. Because I think there are some areas where you do see that there's the discrimination that occurs with algorithms. And that's something yeah. that everybody needs to be mindful of. Yeah. Can and you I give think, an example? Get, well, um, yes, there's a big scandal in South Africa where people who, literally, there's people who've done tests and they will submit the exact same details, but their name will be different. And if you can infer which cultural group they're from, then one person gets a high interest rate on the car loan than the other person. So you do see that sometimes when you've coded a particular um, uh, kind of uh, way of, of deciding who gets credit, who doesn't, and what interest rates it is, sometimes it perpetuates um, discrimination in a way that is actually just, you know, obviously it's, it's just not inclusive, agree, shall not we, inclusive shall at shall all. We say, yeah, yeah. In a polite way. Agree. Um, but I think the, the big thing about um, leveraging some of this technology is the fact that it can make dot connections and dots that sometimes we don't naturally see. And it can identify who are the people who actually are better credits based on different sets of, of um, criteria relative to what the traditional credit um, agencies have been tracking and I think that's the beauty of it that's where we need to kind of think of the fact that the digital world is you know very very vast not yeah. only the web 3 stuff which everybody's yeah, kind of sorry, really yeah. scared about at the moment I'm not and I shouldn't be so dismissive uh, <laughs> governor you just wanted to come in quickly uh, on algorithm could I propose two very simple golden rules and here I take my head as a supervisor of banks and insurance alike the so first golden rule is don't use algorithm you don't understand it's a black box syndrome Absolutely. It looks obvious, but believe me, it would eliminate many of the algorithms. And the second golden rule to bankers and insurers alike is don't sell products you oh. cannot explain. Yeah. And it would have avoided several of the financial crises you mentioned. But believe me, as supervisors, we will be deadly serious about these two rules. Mm. Right, well, listen, mm. we do have to leave mm. it there. We've been on a journey around the world mm from uh, motorbikes in Indonesia to the Cloud 3, Web 7, whatever it is, uh, doing algorithms on people. So I sound like my dad now. They, um, uh, but, I, 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 uh, but I think nothing can be more important than billions of people having access uh, 
to, to the plumbing of the financial system. There are some interesting challenges that come with that. I'm so glad that all of you, when I injected some slight journalistic negativity, swamped <laughs> me with positivity. <laughs> that, is, that is the Davos spirit. Uh, but I think we all learned something about where this agenda is going. We learn about what's happening in different parts of the world. I and mean, I think we will learn more when this new set of figures come out. This seems to be like Absolutely. a great moment on the June the 26th or 7th from the World Bank, the Global Findex numbers will come out showing just how much progress has made uh, and it becomes as more people get connected it becomes even more important so with that thank you to everyone listening back home uh, sorry back in the, around the world thank you for everyone listening well i think my mum's listening back home as well thank you to everybody uh, in the audience and thank you so much to both queen maxima who's had to leave and also this fantastic panel uh, we've made this issue extremely exciting because it's really really important thank you thank you thank you, thank you. So take us off thank you. <laughs>